So we had decided to continue our journey deeper into the country by plane. We flew from Liberia to the capital in a single engine Cessna aircraft of the Costa Rican airline Sansa Airlines, considered one of the most reliable aircrafts with a good reputation. Both pilots were two young Costa Rican women. Flying on such a plane is an interesting adventure in and of itself. We could not stop looking through the windows, the plane flies at low altitude and the whole country is in full view. The ocean, mountains, fields. We flew over plantations planted with palm trees for the manufacture of palm oil, sugarcane, and coffee fields. Flying over the mountains, we got into some strong turbulence and we got pretty scared. The short flight ended with an exciting landing at the Juan Santa Maria International Airport in San Jose. Of course, you can go by car from Liberia, but it'll take about four hours. The capital, San Jose, more realistically reflects the lives of the country's citizens. After the rich villas on the coast, any tourist complexes, hotels, and condos, they are most likely owned by foreign investors. The houses of ordinary Costa Ricans look completely different. Luxury and poverty is everywhere and the poverty rate in Costa Rica is now the highest it's been in 30 years. About a quarter of the country's population lives in poverty. Upon arrival in San Jose, we boarded another plane departing to Palmer Sur Airport, which in Spanish means on the palm of hand. A visit to San Jose was not included in our plans because it is a heavily built urban area like another concrete jungle where about a million people live together in suburbs and there's not much special to see. But if you still put San Jose on your list of places to visit, then the city will open your eyes to many things that are not visible in tourist places. The city also has a fairly high crime rate, so try not to look like a tourist. Don't walk around the city in shorts and with a camera around your neck holding a map. Our journey continued with the same company on an identical plane. The plane gained altitude and headed towards the coast and then flew along the coast, revealing more magnificent views to us. The flight this time went smoothly and we saw from a height the reserve, Manuel Antonio, with a long line of sandy beaches. This reserve is the smallest in the country and it is also the most popular and the most visited. Due to the crowds, the number of visitors is limited Real ecotourist travelers avoid this place, but if you like socializing in restaurants, then Manuel Antonio may appeal to you. It is clearly visible from the plain of the Marino Bolina National Park with this famous figure of the beach in the sea resembling a whale's tail. Ironically, this is where whales come to breed from the Canadian waters of British Columbia and from the Southern Hemisphere all the way to Antarctica. Bolina means whale in Spanish. Shortly before landing, we flew over the largest mangrove wetland in Central America. Taraba Reserve has 66,000 acres of land that is riddled with rivers and flooded with water. Sea turtles used to come here to breed, but this has not happened a lot recently. At the airport, we were met by a taxi driver, and when we arrived at the village of Sierpe, it was already dark. Absolutely nothing was visible. Only sometimes the headlights of the bus illuminated people walking along the road and the driver avoided them carefully. We were quite terrified. Where were we going? In Sierpe itself, for a long time, we could not find any cabinas or any local bed and breakfast. Our driver spoke little English and we knew only a few words in Spanish. It was difficult to understand anything but we finally found our place to stay overnight. The room had two homemade wooden beds covered with a thin mattress. The washroom was equipped with an electrical water heater, AKA suicide shower or the shower of death. Combination of bare 120 volts, wires and water was not inviting even after a long day on the road. I think the electric chair and this water heater were invented by the same person. We decided to stay stinky, but alive. We were so anxious, we couldn't relax, but exhausted from a long day, 
trip after a couple hours, we were tired of being afraid and we just fell asleep. At dawn, the hostess woke us up, going out into the street. We could not believe our eyes when we saw the wild beauty and everything that frightened us in the evening disappeared instantly. We saw that it turns out that we were spending the night on a very bank, on the very bank of the Sierpe River. Crocodiles were quietly swimming in the water and blue water hyacinths thickly grew, covering the surface. Breakfast was already on the table. We had to hurry as it was necessary to stock up on all the food supply we could get. We, so we went to the local shop. To our surprise, everything we needed was there. At nine o'clock, the owner of the very house we were supposed to live in should be able to pick us up. He himself is an American who had moved to live permanently in Costa Rica. We became acquainted, we loaded our things, water, and food onto the boat, and we sailed along the river towards the sea. We were very excited by the premonition of something amazing. The boat's engine howled and we rushed along the river, drenched in the morning sun. The famous phrase in Costa Rica, Pura Vida, translates to pure life from Spanish and it suggests that Costa Rica is one of the happiest countries in the world. We're not going to talk too much about this, since a lot has already been said and written about this. We're just going to try to convey our perceptions and conclusions from everything we've seen. We rushed along the river for about 40 minutes, and when we reached the place where the river Sierpe connected to the ocean, we landed on the beach. On the shore, we met the caretaker, whose task was to protect the helpless tourists from any troubles that could happen. He had several dogs and a machete, and we were told to contact him for any urgent questions. The house in which we lived was located on the mountain, and they helped us take our things up the mountain. The view from this mountain was impressive. The house was very clean. On the table was a tastefully decorated vase of fresh tropical flowers. A family of bats lived and squeaked on the open veranda with whom we were immediately introduced to and ordered not to be afraid of. Solar panels with accumulators was all the electricity we had for a small refrigerator, washing machine, and for night lighting. The refrigerator had to work only during the day and at night we had to turn it off. The bedrooms had spacious and comfortable beds and in the shower there was a gas-fired water heater as well as a stove. The water in the house came directly from a stream on the mountain and therefore it was sometimes dirty but you can still boil food in it and cook with it. There was no gas on the windows and the net was simply stretched over it. And there was also no ceiling under the roof. There was simply just a net. There was also a huge termite mound right above our bed. Cellular communication was almost always absent. It could only be caught if you climbed the mountain, but alone we were not recommended to go. We had to go with the caretaker. The Costa Rican jungle is home to perhaps the largest number of highly venomous snakes, such as vipers, fertilins, and the bushmaster. Sometimes from the place of the bite, depending on where you got bitten, and the size of the snake, a person can only have an hour to an hour and a half to live. If help is not provided on time, the consequences can be dire. Therefore, the owner had a good number of rubber boots in different sizes, and we had to go buy any missing sizes in advance. After examining everything in the house and listening to all the instructions from the owner and agreeing to go deep sea fishing with him, we ran to the beach. The beaches were surrounded by cliffs covered with rainforest and we felt like we were in Avatar. We weren't even surprised if dinosaurs appeared out of the jungle, right there. At the foot of the rocks on the beach, we saw so many representatives of the flora and fauna. Having rested, we booked a boat excursion to the famous Corcovado Nature Reserve. The boat picked us up early in the morning. It was still dark and we had to go to Drake Bay to pick up some more people. We raced in a boat on the ocean, which was the Pacific, and that day we watched the sunrise. I think the Costa Ricans, or they are also called Ticos, they're blessed nation, they have priceless wealth. Costa Rica is renowned for the most abundant life on the planet. In such a small country, more than 900 bird species are recorded, which is more than in the US and in Canada combined. About 1,250 species of butterflies alone. 
Of the seven species of sea turtles, five go out to breed on the beaches of Costa Rica. And although 25% of the country's territory is national parks and reserves, which makes Costa Rica the best country in this regard in Latin America, illegal capture and trade of wild animals, poaching, especially sharks, illegal collection of sea turtle eggs, still continues. In the reserve itself, our instructor took us on a short route. We just walked to the station and back, and in such a short time, we were able to see so many birds, reptiles, and tropical plants, including heliconia, ginger, passionflower, and strelitzia. We saw beautiful bromeliads, aerial plants, orchids, white flower of the caliandra fairy, tropical acaceae, and heliconia crab legs. Among the birds, we managed to see the tropical woodpecker, falcons, tropical pigeons, the great pheasant-like curassow, wild tropical turkeys, vultures, frigates, wood storks, herons, and other birds. We saw the huge golden weaver spider, Nephilia, and we saw many butterflies. In such situations, you should always have some handbook about local flora and fauna with you. We could not even identify some of the birds and it was really difficult with such a wide variety. The reserve is home to five species of wild cats, including the jaguar and the cougar, and they were difficult to see as they are nocturnal animals and they sleep somewhere during the day. Home to the erected monkeys, endangered squirrel monkeys, howler monkeys, and caption monkeys, sloths, anteaters, and we were lucky enough to see the rare nocturnal tapir animal, which quietly fed in the bushes. Tapirs, equid hoofed animals, can perfectly swim and even walk along the bottom of the river feeding on bottom vegetation, and also to hide from predators. Tapirs are very careful animals, so we had to quietly sneak up on it and take a picture. You can spend the night in the reserve at the Serena Station. Cabins for four people without sheets, cold showers, and electricity for only a few hours a day costs around $8 per person. You can pitch your tent for $4 per person. You can order food at the station, but it is not cheap, so it's better to have your own food supplies with you. There are many ticks, therefore, when visiting the reserve, you need to make sure you cover your feet and hands and have appropriate footwear. In general, one day is not enough to visit Corcovado. If we were lucky enough to return, then we would decide to spend three to four days there. You can fly to the reserve by a small plane. There is an airstrip at the mouth of the River Serena. At high tide, sharks come to feed in the sea, and around you can see whales, dolphins, and manatees. With the same tour guide, we agreed the next day to sail to the island of Cano, or Isla del Caño in Spanish. This is also a nature reserve. It's a small island just 16 kilometers in the sea from Corcovado. The rocky island was established as a nature reserve mainly to protect marine life of whales, sharks, turtles, dolphins, fish, and corals. On the island itself, there is no such variety of animals as on the mainland. No people are allowed to disembark here, although there is a check-in station on the shore. Any fishing is prohibited in the area within three kilometers of the island, but there are places for deep diving and for snorkeling. It was exactly on this island where the mysterious balls of stone were found. Only thing we know about these stones is that they were made by people somewhere about one and a half thousand years ago from special volcanic rocks but for what reason, it's unclear. Then we sailed around the island and they took us to a cozy, shallow beach with corals where we went snorkeling. Then we had lunch and on our way back, we tried trolling fishing. The saddest part of the day was the return to the mouth of the river. Depending on the tide time, the waves at the entrance where the sea meets the river can be very high. We held our breath and grabbed the life jackets. Sometimes boats in this place turn over and people drown. Fortunately, our captain was experienced and we entered the mouth safely. Just in a day, we will have the same experience again when we go deep sea fishing with our host. We first learned what seasickness is when we plowed the sea in a desire to catch fish. I must say right away that the concept of catching and releasing fish, as customary as it may seem in America, it does not exist in Costa Rica. Everything that is caught is taken. Nobody here bothers with fishing restrictions or any regulations or any seasonality for fish quantity. Not far from the coast, 
In the rocks, we managed to catch several mackerels, jacks, and groupers. And not far from us, a whale jumped out of the water, straight vertically into the air. But we didn't have enough time to grab the camera. We wanted to get a closer look at the whale, but the owner said that it was too dangerous, especially when the whales are breeding, so he gave gas towards Cano Island. Around the three kilometer zone of the island, there were a lot of fish, and we saw many fishermen. The fish, however, they don't know that the reserve ends within three kilometers, so many get hooked right behind this protected area. We spotted some seagulls, trying to catch some sardines, so we headed towards that. And there we caught some tuna. We have four fishing rods attached to the boat, and sometimes if the fish are all caught at the same time, they can get entangled. The owner's girlfriend pulled the caught fish onto the boat and put it into a large refrigerator. Then she cut off a piece of the tuna, put it on a large hook, and threw it into the depths above the coral reef and rocks, somewhere around 50 meters. After about 10 minutes, the fishing rod started to crackle, and this woman pulled out this giant Almaco jack onto the boat, a fish almost as tall as her. Almaco jack is a relative of the Atlantic amberjack. We caught a lot of fish that day, we got pretty tired, and we were happy to go home. We prepared some fresh di fish for dinner, and now we have enough fish for the rest of our stay. It was a very busy day. Our caretaker, a native Costa Rican, lived in a small house right under the mountain. He did not speak English, and in order to communicate, we had to learn the language. It is an indescribable feeling when you finally begin to understand a person who speaks another language. The most interesting thing that we saw in Costa Rica were the Costa Ricans themselves. Perhaps no one has shown us anything more interesting than our caretaker. He taught us how to fish like the locals do. He walked us safely through the jungle. And we went to look at waterfalls and neighboring beaches without worrying about any poisonous snakes. He always had his dogs with him and a reliable machete. He showed us the ancient graves and ancient shards sheltered from human eyes. I think these shards may have been made in the pre-Columbian era. He showed us more animals just around the house than we saw in any of the reserves. One day he called us to visit Un Buen Lugar. Translated from Spanish is one good place. It became really intriguing, so we went. He had an old leaky boat, but any boat in Costa Rica is a real treasure. We were given a ladle and shown how to scoop the water out of the boat and we sailed up the river since the tide was in our favor. We swam into the dense and jungle by the mangrove thickets. We absolutely did not know where we were going until we reached the very place. We went out into the clear and we were introduced to a local real farmer. All farmers in Costa Rica live significantly richer than the urban population, mostly because they grow their own food. We were immediately surrounded by dogs. Nearby pigs were digging around in the mud by themselves, walking around with the chickens. We were immediately treated with bananas. And that day, for the first time in our lives, we tasted this exotic fruit that you will not even find in shops in Costa Rica themselves. We tried water apples, which in Latin is Sizigium samaringensi. They didn't taste like apples at all, but rather like juicy pears. We were treated to the exotic fruit guanabana, from which the most delicious drinks in Costa Rica are made. And we were treated to water lemon, or Passiflora laurifolia. We have seen breadfruit, tropical rice, and tasted papayas and star fruit. I needed a botanical reference book with me to understand the variety of plants that grew at this farm. I'm not even going to talk about the fact that papaya mango and bananas are so much tastier than what we have bought back in store. Did you know that coca beans can be eaten raw and they are very tasty, similar to like a fruit cream and they're really healthy. We were given many delicious fruit to take with us back. The entire Sierpe River is part of the Taraba Nature Reserve. In addition to bats, red macaw, parrots, black vultures that all live next to the house, hummingbirds fussed around the veranda tirelessly, and chickens nested in the trees at night. Wild cats ran across the roof while we slept, 
and harmless scorpion spiders crawled out from behind the stove. Cockroaches, cucarachas jumped onto the bed, and in the morning, roosters woke us up. Plumeria and orchids bloomed around the house. Costa Rica, like a good book, has revealed its secrets to us a little every day, and we really didn't want to leave. <laughs>